The, the first trait of a pleasing personality always is a positive mental attitude because nobody wants to be around the person who's negative and no matter what other traits you may have, if you don't have a positive mental attitude, at least when you're in the presence of people, you're not going to be considered to have a pleasing personality. And the next one is on flexibility, the ability to unbend and adjust yourself to the varying circumstances of life without going down under them. You know, th there are a lot of people in this world who are so stuck in their habits and in their mental attitude that they cannot adjust to anything that's unpleasant or anything that they don't agree with. You know why Franklin D. Roosevelt was one of the best? Because he adjusted himself to their mental attitude and he didn't get mad at the same time. The elephant has learned to be flexible enough not to get mad when the other fellow is mad. Because there are so many things in this life that you have to adjust yourself to temporarily if you're going to have peace of mind and good health. It might as well start now. Learn to do it. If you're not flexible, you can become flexible. Number three, on the pleasing tone of voice. A lot of people have harsh tones. They talk, does not have personal magnetism. They do not know how to give a pleasing tone to his voice. And he'll never get his audience in a million years if you try. You've got to learn to, if you're going to teach, if you're going to lecture, if you're going to, into public speaking, or even in good conversation, if you can't do that now, you can do it with a little bit of practice, oftentimes by simply lowering your voice, not talking too loudly. I don't think that anybody can teach another person how to make each tone of voice pleasing. I think you have to do that yourself. You have to do it by experimenting. But first of all, before you do it, you have to feel pleased. How could you use a pleasant tone of voice when you felt angry, for instance? You can, but... It's not too effective unless you really feel inside of you the way you're expressing yourself. All those are things. They're carefully studied techniques that you have to acquire. I don't know of anything that will pay off better than to be pleasing in the eyes of other people. It's just one of those things that, that you can't get along without. You know, a lot of people don't understand the full meaning of tolerance. That means an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. You'd be surprised at how few people there are in this world with open minds, have a playlist into pleasing mental attitudes. You've got to have an open mind because the very minute people find that you have prejudices that involve them, any of these things that affect them, they're going to back away from you. Do you have any idea why it is that I can have all of the religious followers of all religions in my classes and get along well with all of them? Uh, to me, they're, they're my fellow beings or my brothers and sisters. I never thought... I think of anybody in terms of what he believes politically or religiously or economically. If you have a closed mind, you'll find that you'll miss out on a lot of information, a lot of facts that you need. That means you've ceased to grow. Um, a keen sense of humor. If you don't have it, you have to cultivate it so that you can adjust yourself to all of these unpleasant things. One of the finest tonics that you can take is to have a good laugh at least several times a day. If you don't have anything to laugh at, look at yourself in the glass. You'll always get a laugh out of that. Surprised you, out of your mind, right while you're doing it. If you've got troubles, they'll melt away. And they won't seem near as big when you're laughing as when you're crying. Next, the frankness of manner and speech. Discriminate control of the tongue at all times based upon the habit of thinking before you speak. Now, most people don't do that. They speak first and think or regret afterward because if you just before you utter any kind of an expression to anybody to figure out whether it's going to benefit the person that's listening or damage it. Well, it's going to benefit you or damage you. Number seven, pleasing facial expression. No, it's a marvelous thing to learn to smile when you're talking to people. You'll be surprised at how much more effective what you say is when you're smiling and then when you're frowning or when you're looking serious. That makes a tremendous difference on the person that's listening. You don't have to be pretty, you don't have to be handsome, but a smile will decorate you and be embellishing no matter who you are, making your facial expression much more beautiful. And then a keen sense of justice, being just with another person even when it's to your disadvantage to do so. What a wonderful thing that is and how that does endear you to other people. Do you have any idea how many people there are that are just fair and just and honest only when they, they know it's going to come back to them in one way or another? How quickly they'd be dishonest if it is profitable to them to do it. 
and then excellent sincerity of purpose. Nobody likes a person who is obviously insincere in what he says and does. Do you think a person who doesn't know anything except about one thing, and you'll find a person that, that becomes tiresome the moment he gets out of that sphere. Tactfulness in your speech and in your attitude toward other people. You'd be surprised how much you can do with people if you're just tactful with them. Oftentimes, instead of telling people to do things or asking them to do things, it might be very tactful and helpful if you requested them uh, and asked them if they would mind doing things, even though you're an authority to give them an instruction. One of the most outstanding employers I ever knew, like Andrew Carnegie, he always asked his associates and his employees if they would mind doing something for him or if it would be convenient or suitable. No wonder he got along so well with people. No wonder he was so successful. Uh, and then the promptness of decisions that you've made. Render snap judgments. Number 13, faith in infinite intelligence. You would be surprised how many people there are to give lip service to this question of faith in the infinite intelligence and don't do very much about it outside of a lip service. They don't indulge in very outstanding acts backing up their alleged belief in infinite intelligence. I don't know how the uh, creator feels about it, but I believe that one act is worth a million tons of good intentions. Probably just one act. Number 14, appropriateness of words. I never saw an age when people indulged in slang statements, double talk, and all that sort of thing as now. And, and it may seem smart to the fellow who's doing it, but it's not smart for the fellow who's listening. Then the, uh, the controlled enthusiasm. Uh, turn on his enthusiasm at the right time, the right amount, and then turn it off at the right time is, is going to be considered to have a pleasing personality. And incidentally, if you're not able to, to exude enthusiasm when you want to, you certainly are not going to be considered a pleasing personality because there are times when you definitely need it. Almost anything that you're doing in human relationships requires a certain amount of enthusiasm at times. And enthusiasm is one of those things you can cultivate. It's just like all these other qualities. Control enthusiasm. You're not going to win all the time in life. Nobody can do that. There are going to be times when you lose. When you lose, lose gracefully and graciously, and then don't take it too seriously, no matter what it is. You know, during the Depression, I had four of my friends. I lost twice as much as they did, and I, I didn't jump off a building. I didn't shoot myself. I didn't poison myself. And I said to myself, well, darn it, all over again, wherever I get a bunch of people together to listen, I'll be able to start making money. You can. Are you going to down a person with that kind of an attitude? No matter how many times he defeats, he's come right up again just like a cork. You can put him down in the water, but he could bounce up the moment. If you don't take it, you'll make it. Number seven, in common courtesy. What a wonderful thing it is to be courteous to the person to whom you don't have to be courteous. I've always thought that anybody that would abuse another person in public and with or without a cause had something wrong with his machinery and then something is missing in life and uh, the appropriateness of personal adornment. Uh, that's important to anybody in public life. Ordinarily, the best dressed person is the one that's dressed so that if you were told to describe how he or she would dress later on, you couldn't do it. You'd say, well, I know it was, he looked nice, or she looked nice. Then good showmanship, you've got to be able to be a good showman. Know when to dramatize words, when to dramatize circumstances. You know, there are certain things, if you describe them in just ordinary language and didn't dramatize them as you went along, well, you'd fall down flat. You've got to learn the art of showmanship as you go along, and it's something you can learn. Then on temperance and eating, drinking, working, playing, and thinking. Do yourself just as much damage with ease as you can with drinking liquor, just as much. I don't allow anything to take charge of me, not too much, not too little. Temperance, temperance. It's a marvelous thing. There's nothing so very bad in it. Don't you know, if you don't overdo it, then patience under all circumstances, you learn to time these things so that you get action out of other people at the time once more, when the time is more favorable. But if you don't have patience, you try to force the hand of other people. You'll get to know where you get it turned out or a knockdown when you don't want it. You require patience in order that you may time your relationships with people. And you have to have a lot of patience. You have to be able to control yourself at all times. Number 23, gracefulness and posture and carriage of the body. If I came in like this, of course, I'd be very comfortable. That's much easier. But it's finer. I mean, stand up like this. Look like I can stand straight without leaning on anything. Slump around and be careless in your posture. Marchie is one who is not too particular about his own personal appearance. 
and so forth. It's, it's a good idea to have gracefulness in posture and carriage of the body. Then uh, uh, the humility of the heart. I don't know of anything as wonderful as to, uh, to have true humility of the heart. Try to maintain that sense of humility in my heart. Regardless of what happens to me that's unpleasant, regardless of how sick. The more successful I become, the more human I observe this feeling of humility of the heart. Recognizing that after all, whatever success I have is due entirely to the friendly, marvelous love and affection and cooperation of other people. Lastly, personal magnetism. That's an inborn trait and the only one of the traits of personality which cannot be cultivated, but it can be controlled and directed to beneficial usage. Convert that great created energy over into doing the thing that you want to do most of the time. Being in that word transmuting, something to conjure with, something to look up in the dictionary, make sure you understand what it means. You're going to find out that when you really come down to answering these questions and giving yourself uh, a rating that you have certain weaknesses that you didn't know you had. Let's find out about ourselves to see just the, where we stand, what it is that makes us tick, why people like us, why people dislike us. The development of character is the great business of life. Your ability to develop a reputation as a person of character and honor is the highest achievement of both social and business life. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear a word you say. The person you are today, your innermost character, is the sum total of all your choices and decisions in life up to this date. Each time you have chosen rightly and acted consistently with the very best that you know, you have strengthened your character and become a better person. The reverse is also true. Each time you have compromised, taken the easy way, or behaved in a manner inconsistent with what you knew to be right, you have weakened your character and softened your personality. The great virtues. There are a series of virtues or values that are usually possessed by a person of character. These are courage, compassion, generosity, temperance, persistence, and friendliness, among others. We'll talk about some of these in part three of this book. Coming before all these values, however, is the most important one of all. When determining the depth and strength of your character, integrity, it is your level of integrity, living in complete truth with yourself and others, that demonstrates more than anything else the quality of your character. In a way, integrity is actually the value that guarantees all the other values. When your level of integrity is higher, you're more honest with yourself and more likely to live consistently with all the other values that you admire and respect. However, it takes tremendous self-discipline to become a person of character. It takes considerable willpower to always do the right thing in every situation. And it takes both self-discipline and willpower to resist the temptation to cut corners, to take the easy way, or to act for short-term advantage. All of life is a test to see what you are really made of deep down inside. Wisdom can be developed in private through study and reflection, but character can only be developed in the give and take of daily life when you're forced to choose and decide among alternatives and temptations. The test of character. It is only when you are under pressure, when you are forced to choose one way or another to either live consistently with a value or to compromise it that you demonstrate your true character. Emerson also said, guard your integrity as a sacred thing. Nothing at last is sacred except the integrity of your own mind. You are a choosing organism. You are constantly making choices one way or the other. Every choice you make is a statement about your true values and priorities. At each moment you choose what is more important or of higher value to you over what is less important or a, of lesser value. The only bulwark against temptation, the path of least resistance and the expediency factor is character. The only way you can develop your full character is by exerting your willpower in every situation. Now, when you're tempted to do what is easy and expedient rather than what is correct and necessary, becoming a person of character for exercising your willpower and self-discipline to live consistently with the very best that you know is tremendous. When you choose the higher value over the lower, the more difficult over the easy, the right over the wrong, you feel good about yourself. Your self-esteem increases. You like and respect yourself more. You have a greater sense of personal pride. In addition to feeling excellent about yourself when you behave with character, you also earn the respect and esteem of all the people around you. They will look up to you and admire you. Doors will be open for you. 
People will help you. You'll be paid more, promoted faster, and given yet even greater responsibilities. As you become a person of honor and character, opportunities will appear all around you. On the other hand, you can have all the intelligence, talent, and ability in the world, but if people do not trust you, you will never get ahead. People will not hire you, and if they do, they will dehire you as soon as possible. Financial institutions will not lend you money because birds of a feather flock together. The only associates, never friends, you will ever have will be other people of questionable character. Furthermore, since the people you associate with have a major effect on your attitude and personality, you make or break your entire life with the quality of your character or the lack thereof. The development of character, Aristotle wrote, all advancement in society begins with the development of the character of the young. This means that advancement in your life begins with the learning and practice of values. You learn values in one or all of three ways of instruction study and practice. Let's look at each of these more closely. Teach your children values. One of the chief roles of parenting is to teach children values. This requires patient instruction and explaining the values to them over and over again as they are growing up. Once is never enough. The value and the importance of living by that value must be explained. Parents must not only give illustrations but also contrast the adherence to a value especially that of telling the truth with its opposite, that of lying or telling half-truths. Children are very susceptible to the lessons they receive from the important people in their lives. As they're growing up, they accept what you say as their parent as a fact, as absolute truth. They absorb what you say like a sponge. You write your description of values on their souls, which are like wet clay, so that what you write becomes a permanent part of the way they see the world and relate to life. More than anything else, as we'll see in chapter 19, you demonstrate your values and your behavior. Your children will watch you and strive to emulate the values that you not only teach and preach, but also practice. And they are always watching. The Rockefeller family children were famous for being taught financial values at an early age. Even though their father was one of the richest men in America, the children were given tasks and chores to perform before they received their allowances. They were then instructed on how to spend their allowances, how to save, how much to give to charity, and how much to invest. As a result, they grew up to become successful businessmen and statesmen. Unlike children who had grown up in wealthy homes, who were seldom disciplined in money matter. Study the values you admire. You learn values by studying them closely. The law of concentration says that whatever you dwell upon grows and increases in your life. Uh, what this means is that when you study and read stories about men and women who uh, demonstrated the kind of values that you admire and respect, and then think about those stories and that behavior, those values sink ever deeper into your mind. Once these values are programmed into your subconscious, they create a propensity within you to behave consistently with those values when the situation requires them. For example, in military training, soldiers are continually told stories of courage, obedience, discipline, and the importance of supporting their fellow soldiers. The more they hear these stories, discuss them, and think about them, the more likely they are to behave consistently with these values when they're under the pressure of actual combat. The core value or virtue of character is truth. Whenever you tell the truth, however inconvenient it may be at the time, you feel better about yourself and you earn the respect of the people around you. One of the highest accolades you can pay another person is to say that he or she always tells the truth. Emulate the people you most admire. Much of your character is determined by the people you most admire, both living and dead. Who are they? Looking over your life and history, make a list of the people whom you most admire. And next to their names, Write out the virtues or values that they most represent to you. If you could spend an afternoon with anyone living or dead, what one person would you choose? Why would you choose that person? What would you talk about during your afternoon together? What questions would you ask and what would you want to learn? Consider this as well. Why would that person want to spend an afternoon with you? What are the virtues and values that you have developed that make you a valuable and interesting person? What makes you special? Practice the values you respect. 
You develop values by practicing them whenever they are called for. As the Roman Stoic philosopher Epictetus said, circumstances do not make the man. They merely reveal him to himself. When a problem occurs, people tend to react automatically based on the highest values that they have developed. Up to that moment, we develop values by repetition, by behaving consistently with a particular value over and over again until it becomes a habit and locks in so that we come to practice it automatically. Men and women with highly developed characters behave in a manner consistent with their highest values and they do so without thought or hesitation. There's no question in their minds about whether or not they're doing the right thing. The structure of personality, the psychology of character involves the three parts of your personality. Your self-ideal, your self-image, and your self-esteem. Your self-ideal is that part of your mind composed of your values, virtues, ideals, goals, aspirations, and your idea of the very best person that you could possibly be. In other words, your self-ideal is composed of those values that you most admire in others and most aspire to possess in yourself. The most important part of your self-ideal is summarized in the word clarity. Superior people are those who are absolutely clear about who they are and what they believe. They have complete clarity about the values they believe in and what they stand for. They are not confused or indecisive. They are firm and resolute when it comes to any decision in which a value is involved. On the other hand, irresolute people are fuzzy and unclear about their values. They have only a vague notion of what is right or wrong in any situation. As a result, they take the path of least resistance and act expediently. They do whatever seems to be the fastest and easiest thing to get what they want in the short term, giving little or no consideration or concern about the consequences of their acts, the evolution of character. In biology, life forms are categorized from the least to the most complex, from single-celled plankton all the way up to the increasingly complex spectrum of life to the human being. Similarly, human beings can be organized along a spectrum as well, from the least to the most developed. The lowest forms of humans are those with no values, virtues, or character. These people always act expediently and take the path of least resistance in their search for immediate gratification. At the highest levels of development of the human race, however, are those men and women of complete integrity who would never compromise their honesty or their character for anything including the threat of financial loss, pain, or even death. George Washington is famous for his honesty, which was demonstrated in the story in which he admitted that he had cut down the cherry tree. In the same vein, the founding fathers of the United States wrote that, we hereby pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In his book, it still was trust. The social virtues and the creation of prosperity, philosopher Francis Fukuyama observed that societies worldwide can be divided into two kinds, high trust and low trust. He also argues that the highest trust societies, those in which integrity is most admired, encouraged and respected, are also the most law-abiding, free and prosperous. At the other end of the societal spectrum, however, are those societies characterized by tyranny, thievery, dishonesty and corruption. Each of these is, without exception, both undemocratic and poor. Trust is the key. Trust is the lubricant of human relationships. Where there is high trust among people, economic activity flourishes, and there are opportunities for all. On the other hand, where there is a low trust, economic resources are squandered in an attempt to protect against thievery and corruption. Or those resources are not available at all. In the United States, we have the Constitution and Bill of Rights, these documents lay out the rules by which Americans agree to live. They create the structure of our government and guarantee our rights, but they assume that our elected representatives will be men and women of honor committed to protecting and defending those rights. They attempt to assure that only men and women of character can thrive and prosper over the long term in our economic, political, and social system. They aim to assure that in most cases, only men and women of character can rise um, to high positions in society. Although our system is not perfect and people of questionable character occasionally rise to positions of prominence, it has seldom lasted for very long. The basic demand of Americans for honesty and integrity eventually leads to the exposure and censure of dishonest people. The demand for men and women of character continues unabated. Your self-image, your inner mirror, the second part of your personality, is your self-image. 
This is the way we see and think about ourselves, especially prior to any event of importance. People always tend to behave on the outside consistently with what they see themselves on the inside. This is often called our inner mirror into which we peer before we engage in any behavior. When you see yourself as calm, positive, truthful, and possessed of high character, you behave with greater strength and personal power. Other people respect you more, and you feel in control of yourself and the situation. What's more, whenever you actually behave in a manner that is consistent with your highest values, your self-image improves. You see and think about yourself in a better light, and you feel happier and more confident. Your behavior and outward performance then reflect this increasingly improving inner picture you have of yourself as the very best person you can possibly be. People tend to accept you at your own evaluation of yourself, at least initially. If you see and think of yourself as an excellent person who is possessed of high character, you will treat other people with courtesy, grace, and respect. In turn, they will likewise treat you as a person of honor and character. Your self-esteem. How much you like yourself, the third part of your personality, is your self-esteem. This is how you feel about yourself, your emotional core. Your self-esteem is defined as how much you like yourself, but it's more than only this. The more you see yourself as a valuable and important person, the more positive and optimistic you will be. When you truly consider yourself to be important and valuable, you will treat other people as if they are important as well. Your self-esteem is largely determined by how consistent your self-image, which shapes your personal behavior, is with your self-ideal or your vision of the very best person you can possibly be. Whenever you act consistently with who you consider an excellent person to be, your self-image improves and your self-esteem increases. You like and respect yourself more and you feel happy about yourself and others. The more you like yourself, the more you like others and the more they like you in return. By acting with character and in harmony with your highest values, you put your whole life internally and externally into an upward spiral. In every area of your life, things will get better and better for you. Your role models have a tremendous impact on shaping your character. The more you admire a person and his or her qualities, the more you strive, consciously and unconsciously, to become like that person. This is why clarity is so important. Always behave consistently. Whenever you act in a way that is consistent with your values, you feel good about yourself. Whenever you compromise your values for any reason, you feel bad about yourself. This also means that when you compromise your values, your self-confidence and self-esteem go down. You feel uneasy, inferior, inadequate, and uncomfortable. When you compromise your values deep down inside, you feel that something is fundamentally wrong. Almost all human problems can be solved by a return to your highest values and your innermost convictions. When you look back, there have probably been situations in your life when you have compromised your values in order to save an investment, keep a job, preserve a relationship, or maintain a friendship. In each case, uh, you have felt worse and worse until you finally broke it off and walked away. And how did you feel when you finally had the strength of character to walk away? You felt wonderful. Whenever you use your willpower and strength of character to return to the values that are most dear to you, you are rewarded with a wonderful feeling of happiness and acceleration. You feel energized and free. You wonder why you didn't make that decision a long time ago. I do the right thing. In the development of character that is based on self-discipline and willpower, long-term thinking is essential. The more you think about the long-term consequences of your behavior, the more likely it is that you will do the right thing in the short term. So when you have to make a choice or a decision, always ask the magic question, what's important here? Uh, I practice the universal maxim of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher. He said, resolve to behave as though your every act were to become a universal law for all people. One of the great questions for the development of character is this. What kind of a world would this world be if everyone in it were just like me? Whenever you sleep, whenever you do or say something that is inconsistent with your highest values, immediately get back on your horse. Say to yourself, this is not like me, and resolve that next time you'll do better. What you dwell upon grows. If you are in a situation today in which you are not living up to your highest values, make a decision this very minute to confront the situation and straighten it out.
The minute you do, you will once again feel happy and back in control. There's an old Indian story. On my shoulders are two wolves. One is a black wolf, evil, who continually tempts me to do and say the wrong things. On my other shoulders, a white wolf that continually encourages me to live up to my very best. A listener asked the old man, which of these wolves has the greatest power over you? The old man replied, the one I feed. By the law of concentration, whatever you dwell upon grows and increases in your life. When you think and talk about the virtues and values that you most admire and respect, you therefore program those values deeper and deeper into your subconscious until they begin to operate automatically in every situation. Whenever you exercise your self-discipline and willpower to live your life consistently with those values that you most aspire to be known for, you begin to move rapidly along the path to becoming an excellent person. Here's the definition of success and failure. Just make this note. Here's failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day. Now, you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say, I can understand that. A few errors in judgment repeated every day for six years. I'm with my father. I think I told the story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, he's never been ill, still hasn't retired. It's not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We drilled a new well, got some extra water, got some more acres going. He's all excited at midnight. We're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed. Don't have to go to bed hungry. And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said to my father, so healthy. My mom taught us all those good health practices. Taught me when I was growing up. Right? I'm an only child. I've never been ill. That's the big five zero some time ago. My two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill. My grandkids never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, suddenly it occurred to me, I know that's part of it. An apple a day. That's gotten to Dallas, Fort Worth, right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, oh, well, Mr. Owen, if that's true, that would be easy to do. Then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy next door says, a Hershey bar a day. Say, oh, no, you've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You've got to be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You've got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Sometimes in the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment or philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year? Six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you, the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic. If you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment? Like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25. That's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling, saying, Hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm a 25-year-old American male. I've got a nice family. Every reason to do well. And I messed up. That was messed up. I used to think it was the community that was messed up. And the country was messed up. And the government was messed up. If those Democrats ever get in the White House, that will really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that will really mess things up. 
The economy was messed up. Interest rates were messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy, my own errors in judgment. If my own personal philosophy brought me in six years, two pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well living in America. A 25-year-old American male got a family, every reason to do well. Once I understood this, here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment. Being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. Kill it. It's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. A guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar, whether it's your money, or whether it's your cholesterol counts. All you've got to do is commit the errors. And just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple, you say, well, I didn't need an apple today and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you've got to be brighter than that. Someday you've got to leave first grade. Reason we make those first grade desks so small so they won't fit at age 25, I mean, right? You don't belong here anymore. Let me give you the secret to success, the formula for failure. A few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits, and with your communication habits, with your sales habits, and management habits, and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors. And replace it with disciplines practiced, I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately after today. You don't ever have to be the same again, only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today, only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Cohen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start but with an apple? You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What'll that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, though, might mean you're careless. Well, probably means you're stubborn, and either one is called disaster. Could should, though. I'm telling you. That's why at the end of five years, I've six years, I found myself with pennies in my pocket. Nothing in the bank. Creditors calling. Could should, well. Could should, don't us call disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire by the time I'm 31. I'm a millionaire, how about that? You say, well, Mr. Owen, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same, my negative relatives were nothing. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, and coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life within a six year period. I was never the same, and I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday somebody says, you should have heard Jim Ron 10 years ago when he was really terrific. I want people to say, I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you, the man works on his craft. I'm telling you, the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you, the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you, he's worked hard on himself, that's why he's able to deliver like he does.
The same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson. Running a business doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself. This is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors. That's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. What was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Sho said. Mr. Ohn, you don't have to change country, but you do have to change velocity. Well, and if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income. You can turn around your bank account. You can turn around your skills. You can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential. All the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another plan. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now I can spend the whole day on philosophy. That's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you'd pick up the commitment like I did. Say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy and then go to the more complicated discipline. Because if you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated thoughts? Held in mind, produce after their kind. What you think becomes your reality. Earl Nightingale in his audio program, The Strangest Secret, says that you become what you think about. Ralph Waldo Emerson summarized this idea more than a hundred years before by saying, a man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. The law of mind is extremely powerful and is, in many ways, a basic law for explaining many of the other laws that refer to mind action. The natural extension of the law of mind is the third law of success, called the law of mental equivalency. This law says that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental equivalent of what you wish to experience in each dimension of your external life. If you want to be happy, you need to clearly define for yourself and create the mental equivalent or picture of exactly what happiness means to you. If you wish to enjoy health and long life or happy relationships or financial prosperity, you need to create in your mind an exact, detailed picture of what you desire as a result of a whole series of other laws that I'll be discussing. This becomes the critical starting point that begins inevitably to lead you to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success is called the law of correspondence. This law has been talked about for perhaps 4,000 years and it's one of the fundamental laws that explains human experience. It simply says that as within, so without. It says that your outer life will tend to be a mirror image of your inner life. Your external world will tend to correspond almost exactly to what is going on inside both your conscious and subconscious minds. There are four major areas where you see the law of correspondence working all the time. First is simply in your attitude. Whatever your attitude is, often before you even say anything, people will reflect it back to you in the way they talk to you, in the way they talk to you and treat you. As within, so without. The second area where the law of correspondence is evident is in your relationship. Your relationships will almost perfectly mirror your attitude and your personality. If you're a good and happy person, you'll have good and happy relationships. As you become a more patient and tolerant and loving person, your relationships will reflect this almost immediately, very much as a mirror will do. The third area of correspondence that you see is in your health. Much of your health can be directly traced to specific attitudes that cause you to suffer from minor and major illnesses. The extensive work that's been done in the area of holistic medicine seems to suggest that there are corresponding attitudes of mind for most illnesses that you or I suffer from, the common cold and flu, all the way up to the most serious illnesses that are often life-threatening. Whenever you're anxious or upset or unhappy for any reason, for any period of time, your body will begin to reflect those feelings. The entire basis of psychosomatic medicine is the conclusn that your mind, psycho, makes your body soma sick. What your mind harbors, 
your body eventually expresses. The fourth application of the law of correspondence is that your external world of material accomplishment will exactly correspond to your internal world of preparation. The more knowledge and skill you gain that helps you to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You can't hope to acquire or achieve anything more on the outside until you've acquired it or achieved it on the inside. The law of correspondence reigns supreme. The fifth law of success is the law of belief, which says that whatever you believe with emotion becomes your reality. You always have a tendency to act in a manner consistent with your innermost beliefs and convictions. Your beliefs, in fact, act like a filter or a screen that edits out incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness the things that you've already decided are true about yourself and the world. William James of Harvard said, belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible it says, whatever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. <laughs> For example, if you absolutely believe that you are meant to be a great success in life and that no matter what happens, nothing can stop you from achieving the greatness that is yours, you'll act in a manner consistent with that belief and you'll eventually make it come true. If you doubt your ability to be successful for any reason, this negative belief will be demonstrated in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the necessity for you to question your own self limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act like the brakes on your potential. These are the nagging doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their abilities that cause them to sell themselves short. When you have self-limiting beliefs, you have a tendency to sell or far less than you may be capable of. Self-limiting beliefs revolve around your ability to lose weight or quit smoking or earn a certain amount of money or be attractive to members of the opposite sex or develop new abilities that are more conducive to your success and happiness. One of the most important steps you can take toward achieving great success is for you to question these self-limiting beliefs. You might even ask others who know you well what self-limiting beliefs they seem to think that you have that may be holding you back. Remember, self-limiting beliefs are often used as excuses. A good way to test your self-limiting beliefs is to ask yourself whether anyone else with the limitations you perceive you have has nonetheless gone on to achieve success. You can also look at your own actions to decide what it is that you truly value. Remember, it's not what you say or hope or wish or intend that is a true expression of your values and beliefs. It's only what you do. Children are very aware of this and they ignore the aware of this and they ignore the advice of their parents when their parents say, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, the fact is we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their innermost convictions. There's a great deal of confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write about it, it means that they truly believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe what you do. Your actions do speak far more loudly than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication, it'll be evident in the things that you do every single day. If you truly believe in the values of honesty and integrity and self-discipline, you'll demonstrate these qualities in your every behavior. In fact, you can tell what a person values by looking at what they did in the past when the pressure was on. It's only when they're forced to make a choice that you know what it is you really value. For example, when you have to choose between family and work or between money and work or between money and honesty, your true values come out. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistent with them, even if you haven't yet made them, takes part of your character. I'll explain this later in the program. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by inner desires and urges and urges and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level, and your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations. By what you really want and need in life, not by what you think you want. This is an extension of the law of values, and it's very important for you to understand. There's a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. The ABC stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequences. The antecedents are the things that happen before the behavior. Behaviors are the things you do. The consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know that psychologically only about 15% of your motivation 
comes from the antecedents, from what you read or learn or are told to do or not do. However, about 85% of your motivation comes from your expectations. What do you think will happen? It's your beliefs about the consequences about the future that cause you to behave in a certain way. The clearer you are about the consequences of your actions and the more intensely you desire to enjoy the consequences that your behaviors may lead to, the more motivated you'll be. This is why it's so important to have absolute clarity with regard to your goals in each area of your life in order for you to be motivated to perform at your very best. An important point with regard to the EPSI formula is that your behaviors are not guaranteed to achieve the consequences that you desire, but every behavior or action that you engage in will generate a consequence of some kind. One of the most important parts of understanding motivation and behavior is to realize that both actions and inactions have consequences. What you do as well as what you fail to do will have a consequence in your future and sometimes the consequences can be dramatic and long-lasting. A good exercise in success is for you to write out a description of the type of person that you'd like to be and the kind of life that you'd like to be living. The most powerful faculty that you'd like to be living, the most powerful faculty that you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more accurately you can think about who you are and what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it, the more effective and successful you will be. The eighth law of success is the law of subconscious activity and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that whatever thought or idea mixed with emotion you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. This means that whatever thought, idea or goal you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis you can have because your subconscious mind will go to work to organize all of your thoughts and actions to bring it into your reality. If you desire to earn or attain a certain amount of money and you think about it continually day and night and you use every means possible to drive this desire or hope deep into your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind will begin committing more and more of its reserve capacity or bringing that goal or desire into your life. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once you give it the proper commands, will trigger your reticular cortex and its function. The reticular activating system. Your reticular cortex is a small finger like part of your brain that alerts you to events and circumstances around you that are consistent with your dominant desires or concerns. For example, if you decided that you wanted to buy a red sports car, this desire would signal to your reticular cortex that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere. Even a block away, you would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means of attaining one of them. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence and you imbue this goal with intense desire, your reticular cortex will cause you to be extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you to earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might have been unaware of completely in the absence of having established this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind which controls your autonomic nervous system and all of your muscles, nerves, actions, and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California, Santa Barbara, has concluded that when you communicate with others, fully 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language, 38% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice, and only 7% of the message you send is contained in your tone of voice, and only 7% of the message is contained in the actual words that you use. And your body language and tone of voice are largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you've sent to your subconscious mind as the result of the way you think and feel. For example, when you've had a success of any kind, you send a charge of emotional energy to your subconscious mind that tells it that you're a winner. For some time afterwards, you walk and talk and act and think like a winner. Your step will be brisker, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your entire body, voice, and tone to fit a pattern consistent with it. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations. It's often called the law of the self-fulfilling prophecy. 
It's one of the most powerful of all laws because of its simplicity and its predictability. This law simply says that whatever you expect with confidence will have a tendency to materialize in your life. You get not what you want, but what you expect with the greatest intensity. For this reason, an attitude of positive self-expectancy seems to go hand in hand with great success in every area of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk and talk and act as though you believe the entire world was conspiring to help you achieve your goals. You can become what W. Clement Stone is often referred to as an inverse paranoid. You can become convinced that the entire world is conspiring to do you good. The way that you apply the law of expectations is by constantly looking for the good in every person in every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look into the setback for the valuable lesson that it might contain. Instead of becoming upset, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This kind of affirmation causes you to, affirmation causes you to, affirmation you do with a more positive and open and optimistic attitude. The most powerful of all expectations are the expectations you have of yourself. You should approach everything you do with an attitude of calm, confident self-expectancy. You should expect to be successful more times than you're unsuccessful. Expect to win more times than you lose and expect to eventually achieve your goals if you carry on long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It says that whatever you concentrate on and think about repeatedly with emotion tends to become more and more a part of your inner and outer life. Some of the most important work in psychology shows that if you dwell upon qualities that you wish to develop, like courage and sincerity and persistence, you tend to actually build those qualities brick by brick into your character and personality. The law of concentration goes hand in hand with the law of subconscious activity and it largely explains the person that you are today. Whatever you've concentrated on in the past and are concentrating on the present is having a major impact on your conduct and behavior. What you concentrate on largely determines the quality and quantity of the results that you get and the success that you enjoy. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. It says that virtually everything that you do is automatic and unthinking. You are largely a creature of habit. It says that from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you have a tendency to follow the path of least resistance and to do the things that you've become accustomed to doing in the past. You eat the same foods for breakfast, you brush your teeth with the same toothpaste, you take the same route to work, you greet people with the same words, you go to lunch at the same time, you work in the same way. Now, there's nothing wrong with establishing habits that enable you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the degree to which many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, such as driving your car, have become automatic and unthinking. When you make certain things habitual so they no longer require thought, your mind then becomes free to concentrate on other things that could be more helpful to you in achieving the things that you really want. There are several parts of the law of habit. First of these is that good habits are hard to form but easy to live with. Second part is that bad habits are easy to form but hard to live with. One of the hardest of all things to change are bad habits which are counterproductive to the goals that you want to achieve. Therefore, important for you to sit down and think through the habits that you have, analyze them carefully. You need to decide whether or not they are moving you towards your goals or away from them. Remember, one of the most important of all observations on success is that everything you do either moves you in one direction or moves you in the other. Nothing is neutral. Everything counts. If a habit isn't helpful, it is hurtful. If a habit is not leading you to success, it's probably leading you to failure. The way that you overcome bad habits is simply to override them by the development of new, more positive habits. For example, if you have a golf swing that's causing your ball to go into the rough, you could override that habitual swing by taking lessons and learning how to hit the ball differently. Um, if you have a habit of getting up later than you should, you can override that habit by repeatedly getting up earlier until that new behavior becomes the habit that dominates your thinking and your action. It's by practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and thinking continually about how you would be with a new habit or behavior. You derive this message in your subconscious mind and you eventually begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you want. 
This brings us to the twelfth law, one of the most important of all the laws of success, and that is the law of attraction. The law of attraction says that you are a living magnet to inevitably attract into your life the people, events, and circumstances that harmonize with your dominant thoughts. This is why we say that whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuing basis you have, whatever thought you hold clearly and mix with emotion, begins setting up a force field of mental energy that begins drawing towards you the things that you need. This law of attraction has been written about for hundreds if not thousands of years. Contained in the old folk sayings like, like, attracts like or like begets like or you've perhaps heard birds of a feather flock together. My friend Mark Victor Hansen says that whatever you want wants you. These are all ways of saying that your mind is extremely powerful. And that whatever you think emotionalized comes a form of energy like a magnet that's attracting the events and circumstances you experience into your life. The law of attraction is often referred to as the law of sympathetic resonance. Explains, for example, that if you have two pianos in a large room and you get A of C, one of the pianos, and then walk across the room to the other piano, the C note or string on the second piano will be vibrating perfect harmony or resonance with the SECS string on the first. One of the most common examples of this law is when you enter a room full of people, you almost invariably have a sympathetic resonance or attraction with someone else in the room you'll have a tendency to gravitate toward a person with whom you are comfortable and compatible and that person will have a tendency to gravitate very often two single people at a social gathering will have a level of sympathetic resonance draws them toward each other and into conversation it's by the same token have a very clear goal or idea you will attend to attract people to you and be attracted to people who have ideas and information and resources that can help you to realize that goal another illustration of the law of attraction is its opposite which is the law of repulsion. When you begin to become a particular kind of person because of the way you change your thinking, you will find yourself attracted okay, or similar to you and you will also find yourself repelling and being repelled by people who don't think the way you do. This law explains why positive people tend to associate with other positive people and why negative people tend to associate with other negative people. Why neither group finds the other group of very much interest and begin to fill your life with the kind of people that you respect and admire by simply becoming the kind of person in your thoughts that will attract them. Thirteenth law of success is the law of choice which says that you are always free to choose the content of your conscious mind but in doing so you are choosing every other part of your life. Your thoughts control your reality. Since no one else but you can think for you the thoughts that you choose to harbor determine everything that happens in your life. The wonderful thing about the law of choice is that it says that have complete freedom to think and therefore to be anything that you intensely desire. Choice is always up to you. The law of choice also says that you are where you are and what you are because you have chosen to be there. If you are not happy with where you are and what you are, it's up to you to choose to be and do something else. Fourteenth law of success is the law of optimism, which simply says that a positive mental attitude goes hand in hand with success and happiness in virtually every dimension of life. Quality of optimism is the quality that makes you into a cheerful and pleasant person, a person that other people like and want to be around and help. The most successful men and women tend to be very likable people. The more optimistic you are, the happier you'll be moment to moment, and the more things you'll be willing to attempt. Fifteenth law of success, the law of change, says simply that change is inevitable. The constant we have in life is that of change. Everything is changing even as you listen to this tape. But the wonderful thing about the law of change is that nothing is fixed. All progress requires change. Change is happening in any case. You can be and have and do anything you want by simply harnessing the forces of change and taking advantage. Law of change also says that your life can only get better when you get better, not until. It says that you can't remain the same and somehow improve. The law says that if you don't take advantage of change, you will end up being the victim. It will happen over which you have little or no control. And you'll simply have to go along and adjust your actions behaviors to whatever occurs. Now let me tell you a story that is true in more cases than not. Once upon a time there was a young man from an average home, an average education, working at an average job and who had an average group of friends. Most average young men was primarily interested in girls, sports and television. He liked to have a good time and he spent most of his money enjoying himself. Looked upon his job as a necessary evil that paid for his average lifestyle and like most average people he was going nowhere with his life. One day, something happened to him. Perhaps he read a book that woke him up or 
an audio program or attended a motivational seminar, whatever it was, he wasn't the same after. Realize, choose to do, be something else. Applied the law of choice. By the law of change, he realized that his life could only improve if he began changing in a positive direction. Using the law of cause and effect, he made some decisions about what he wanted to accomplish and then began searching out the causes, the effects he desired. By the law of optimism, he was positive toward himself. Positive. Expected good things to happen, triggering the law of expectation. He went to work on his thinking and he began to dwell by the law of concentration on his ideal lifestyle. It's by the law of subconscious activity. He began to walk and talk like the person he envisioned himself becoming. He also began noticing opportunities to advance himself that he hadn't seen before. As he changed his thinking, triggered the law of mind and the law of mental equivalency, created a clear picture of his goals. The law of correspondence, his outer world began to reflect his new improved inner world by himself began to change and by the law of attraction people and resources began to appear to help him move one thought as he concentrated on his desires his values and motivations changed and he began developing the kind of habits that lead to no time at all by bringing his life into alignment and harmony with the laws of success he began moving forward at a rate that surprised him so can you the laws of success are based on the foundational principle that in order for you to succeed you must first decide what success needs. You can then begin to apply these laws to your definition of success to bring it more rapidly into your reality. Get off of Instagram and Snap and get off all these blogs. Get into something that can really, really move your life forward. Getting successful is not a magic trick. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is here. If you want to be successful, you have to change this. This has to change. It's not what makes it hard. It's your lack of belief that it can happen for you. It's all. If you're at a place in your life and you aren't happy with it, you have to change something. You have to make a conscious, interesting decision that you're going to change and it's not dependent on anybody else. You get to decide if you're going to be rich, poor, mediocre, plentiful, happy, sad. Really not important what the majority of people that are blogging bag. As a matter of fact, bloggers are not relevant. When you spend so much time in the blog world, the Instagram world, the chat world, all of this, you're wasting valuable time. I was young and I had what you have. And you're the brightest group of young people that have come along in a long time. Man, millennials are absolutely brilliant because you all have technology. You all got Google. You could Google anything. Stuff in your fingertips that can make you great. But if you could combine your technology with your parents and your grandparents' work ethic. Yo, you could be rich. You could be rich, man, but you cannot erase the work ethic. I hate it when I see young people wasting their time. Wasting all this technology, just bull, just sitting around in this world that's been created for you. That everything is instant. Gotta understand that success. You can't Google success. Can't Google it, man. I've seen stuff hopefully you'll never see, and I've seen some things I hope one day you do see, but go Google exposure. It ain't gonna take you nowhere. I have a life of convenience now, but in order to get the life of convenience, got to have a very uncomfortable life. Stop trying to do everything the short way. Stop trying to figure out the easy way because it ain't gonna happen. You gotta get messed up sometimes. You gotta get dirty. You gotta get your feelings hurt. You gotta get disappointed. You gotta get told no. But at least then when I see somebody trying and I tell them no, I try to at least give them something. Once you get this, y'all, you can change everything. Negativity, you can protect yourself from negativity and that's what stops Brown scene, it's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door, so I walk out as a positive. Get tired sometimes because I get mentally drained from my job at times. But to coat your mind from negativity. The way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple. Gratitude, gratitude erases negativity. You wake up in the morning and start having negative thoughts. I'm tripping. I just don't feel myself. Every time you feel in the middle of the day, if you feel yourself doing that, stop. Stop for a second and start going over in your mind. Everything you have to be grateful for. Everything you already have. You walk. That's a blessing. You woke up, that's another blessing. The fact that you can see, think, reason, that's another blessing. And go somewhere and get yourself something to eat. That's another blessing. The ability to dream is a blessing. Start coding your mind with gratitude. It can change everything for you. Today we unravel the mysteries of human achievement and unlock the gates to boundless empowerment.
For nestled within the fabric of our daily routines lies a singular habit, a habit so potent it has the power to bestow upon you a mantle of greatness. Amidst the hustle and bustle of our modern lives, there exists a subtle yet profound force. A habit that when cultivated with diligence and intention can elevate you to heights beyond your wildest dreams. It is not the grand gesturous or momentous acts that define our success, but rather the daily rituals, the habits that shape our destiny. And within the realm of habit lays a treasure trove of untapped potential, waiting to be discovered by those brave enough to seek it. It is the habit of setting audacious goals and pursuing them with unwavering determination. It is the habit of seizing each day as an opportunity for growth, of embracing challenges as stepping stones to success. Consider, if you will, the lives of history's greatest achievers, titans of industry, the visionaries, trailblazers. What set them apart from the masses was not merely talent or luck, but a steadfast commitment to their craft, a dedication to mastery that propelled them to greatness. They understood that success is not a destination, but a journey, a journey marked by the daily cultivation of habits that lead to excellence. For just as a single drop of water has the power to carve through stone, so too does the habit of self-improvement have the power to shape your destiny. Together, let us embark on this noble quest, and may we emerge victorious. Powerful beyond belief, Earl Nightingale in his inspiring program, The Strangest Secret, posits that what you think over time becomes your reality. This idea, also expressed by Ralph Waldo Emerson, highlights that you become what you predominantly occupy in your thoughts. The law of the mind, according to Nightingale, is extremely powerful and serves as a fundamental law to explain many others addressing the action of the mind. Its natural extension is the third law of success known as the law of mental equivalence. This law holds that your primary responsibility to yourself is to create a clear and accurate mental representation of what you wish to experience in every aspect of your external life. If you seek happiness, you need to clearly define what that means for you and build an exact mental picture of that happiness. The same applies if you yearn for good health, satisfying relationships, or financial prosperity. You must create in your mind a detailed image of those desires. Nightingale argues that this process is the crucial starting point that invariably leads to the realization of your dreams and goals. The fourth law of success, as explained by Nightingale, is the law of correspondence, a notion that has been discussed for millennia and explains human experience. This law states that what is within is reflected without. Your external life is an almost exact reflection of what is happening in your mind, both at the conscious and subconscious levels. This law of correspondence also holds that your external world of material achievements will correspond exactly to your inner world of readiness. The more knowledge and skill you acquire to be more effective in your work, the more you will be paid. You cannot expect to acquire or achieve something outwardly until you have acquired or achieved it inwardly. The law of correspondence reigns supremely. It operates constantly in various areas. First, in your attitude, how others perceive and treat you reflects your internal attitude. Second, in your relationships, these reflect your attitude and personality. If you are a positive person, you will have positive relationships. By becoming more patient and loving, your relationships will change immediately, like a mirror. The third area where the law of correspondence operates is in health. According to Nightingale, much of your health is directly linked to specific attitudes that can cause anything from minor illnesses to serious conditions. Holistic medicine suggests that there are corresponding mental attitudes for most common ailments, from colds to serious illnesses. In summary, according to Nightingale, the law of correspondence establishes that your external world reflects your internal world and understanding and working with these mental laws are essential to achieving your dreams and goals. The fifth law of success is the law of belief, which states that what you believe with emotion becomes your reality. You always tend to act consistently with your deepest beliefs. Your beliefs act as a filter or screen that edits incoming information and only allows into your conscious awareness. Those things that you have already decided are true about yourself and the world. As William James of Harvard said, 
Belief creates the actual fact. In the Bible, it is said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For example, if you absolutely believe that you are destined to achieve great success in life and that nothing can stop you from reaching the greatness that is rightfully yours, you will act consistently with that belief and eventually make it a reality. If you doubt your ability to succeed for some reason, this negative belief will manifest in your tendency to hold yourself back. The most important part of the law of belief is the need to question your own limiting beliefs. These are the beliefs that act as breaks on your potential, the persistent doubts and fears that people have about themselves and their abilities, which lead them to settle. When you have limiting beliefs, you tend to settle for much less than you are capable of. To embark on the path to extraordinary success, we must first confront these limiting beliefs head on. We must dare to question their validity, to shine a light on the falsehoods that hold us back from realizing our dreams. And what better way to do so than to seek the wisdom of those who know us best. Ask them, my friends, ask them what limiting beliefs they perceive in you. For often it is through the eyes of others that we gain clarity on our own limitations. But remember that limiting beliefs are but mere illusions, smoke and mirrors that cloud our judgment and hinder our progress. Test them against the light of truth. Ask yourselves. Have others with similar limitations achieved the success we desire? And as you ponder this question, reflect on your action. For it is in your deeds, not your words, that your true values and beliefs are revealed. Children are very aware of this and ignore their parents' advice when their parents say, Do as I say, not as I do. The truth is that we all seem to know that a person's actions are the true reflection of their deepest convictions. There is much confusion and unhappiness in the world today because many people feel that if they say something emphatically enough or write it down, it means they really believe it. But this is false. You only truly believe in what you do. Your actions speak much louder than your words. For example, if you truly believe in the values of persistence and dedication in the things you do every day, if you truly believe in the values of honesty, integrity, and self-discipline, you will demonstrate these qualities in each of your behaviors. In fact, you can determine a person's values by observing what they did in the past when the pressure was on. Only when you are forced to make a decision is when you know what you truly value. For example, when you must choose between family and work or between money and honesty, your true values come to light. The wonderful and important thing about your values is that you can develop them in yourself by disciplining yourself to act consistently with them. Even if you haven't yet made them a fixed part of your character. The seventh law of success is the law of motivation, which says that everything you do is triggered by internal desires, impulses, and instincts, many of which may be at an unconscious level. Your attitudes and behaviors will be determined by your dominant motivations by what you really want and need in life, not by what you think you want. This is an extension of the law of values and it is very important that you understand it. There is a simple formula called the ABC formula of human motivation and human action. The ABC acronym stands for antecedents, behavior, and consequence. Antecedents are the things that happen before behavior. Behavior is the things you do and consequences are what happens as a result of your behavior. We know that psychologically only about 15% of your motivation comes from antecedents, from what you read, learn, or are told to do or not do. You see, a staggering 85% of your motivation stems from the expectations you hold, the beliefs you harbor about the future that awaits you. The clearer you paint the picture of your desired future, the more vividly you envision the consequences of your actions, the stronger your motivation becomes. Clarity is not a luxury, it is a necessity. It is the cornerstone upon which success is built. For without absolute clarity about your goals, about the outcomes you seek to achieve in every facet of your life, your motivation wanes, your efforts falter. Now, let's talk about the ABC formula. A simple yet profound concept that holds the key to understanding motivation and behavior. It's a simple equation. Action begets consequence. But here's the twist. It's not just your actions that shape your reality. It's also your inaction. Yes, my friends, even the decision to do nothing carries with it a consequence. What you do, as well as what you fail to do, will have consequences in your future. 
and sometimes the consequences can be dramatic. A good exercise for success is to write a description of the kind of person you would like to be and the kind of life you would like to lead. The most powerful faculty you have is your ability to think, your ability to understand. The more precisely you can think about who you are and what you want to achieve and how to achieve it, the more effective and successful you will be. The tenth law of success is the law of subconscious activity and it has several applications. The first part of this law is that any thought or idea mixed with emotion that you hold in your conscious mind will be accepted as a command by your subconscious mind. This means that any thought, idea, or goal you can continuously hold in your mind, you can achieve because your subconscious mind will work to organize all your thoughts and actions to bring it into your reality. The second part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, once given the proper commands, will activate your reticular activation system and its function. Your reticular activation system's function is a brain filter-like part that alerts you to events that are consistent with your desires or dominant emotions. For example, if you decide you want to buy a red sports car, this desire would send a signal to your reticular activation system that red sports cars are now of paramount importance to you. From that moment on, you would see red sports cars everywhere, even blocks away. You would become extremely alert and sensitive to red sports cars, as well as to the means to obtain one. If one of your goals is to achieve financial independence, the reticular activation system will make you extremely sensitive to all kinds of opportunities around you that would help you earn more money. You would hear and see things everywhere that you might not have been aware of at all in the absence of having set this goal and planted it in your subconscious mind. The third part of the law of subconscious activity is that your subconscious mind, which controls your autonomic nervous system and all your muscles, nerves, actions and reactions, also controls your body language and your tone of voice. Professor Moravian of the University of California at Santa Barbara has concluded that when you communicate with others, 55% of the message you send is contained in your body language, 38% of the message is contained in your tone of voice, and only 7% of the message is contained in the actual words you use. And your body language and tone of voice are largely controlled by messages about yourself and your goals that you have sent to your subconscious mind as a result of how you think and feel. For example, when you have had a success of any kind, you send an emotional charge to your subconscious mind that tells it you are a winner. For some time afterward, you will walk, talk, act, and think like a winner. Your step will be more energetic, your voice will be stronger, your eyes will be more focused, and your body language will signify this belief about yourself. Your subconscious mind will accept your predominant emotional thoughts and organize your whole body, voice, and tone to fit a pattern consistent with that. The ninth law of success is the law of expectations, often called the self-fulfilling prophecy law, is one of the most powerful laws because of its simplicity and predictability. This law simply states that what you confidently expect tends to materialize in your life. You do not get what you want, but what you expect most intensely. For this reason, a self-expectancy attitude can lead to great success in all areas of your life. The wonderful thing about the law of expectations is that you have the power to manufacture your own expectations. You can decide to expect only good things to happen to you. You can walk, talk, and act as if you believe that everyone is conspiring to help you achieve your goals. You can become what Clement Stone often called a reverse paranoid. You can convince yourself that everyone is conspiring to do you good. The way you apply the law of expectations is by constantly seeking the good in every person and in every situation. When you have a temporary setback, you can look for the valuable lesson it might contain. Instead of getting angry, you can say to yourself something like, I believe in the perfect outcome of every situation in my life. This type of affirmation makes you approach everything you do with a more positive, open, and optimistic attitude. The most powerful expectations are those you hold for yourself. You should approach everything you do with a calm and confident attitude of expectation. You should expect to succeed more often than not, expect to win more times than you lose, and expect to eventually reach your goals if you persist long enough. The tenth law of success, which applies to many other areas of life, is called the law of concentration. It states that whatever you focus on and repeatedly think about with emotion tends to become more and more a part of your internal and external life. The eleventh law of success is the law of habit. 
it states that virtually everything you do is automatic and unconscious. You are largely a creature of habit. From the moment you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night, you tend to follow the path of least resistance and do the things you have become accustomed to in the past. There is nothing wrong with establishing habits that allow you to simplify your life. In fact, your life becomes successful to the extent that many of the things you once needed to concentrate on, like driving a car, have become automatic and unconscious. There are several parts to the law of habit. The first part is that good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. The second part is that bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. One of the most difficult changes of all are bad habits that are counterproductive to the goals you wish to achieve. Therefore, it is important for you to sit down and reflect on the habits you have and carefully analyze them. You need to decide if they are leading you toward your goals or away from them. The third part of the law of habit is that your mind becomes a slave to your habit. Once you form a habit, your mind becomes accustomed to following that pattern rather than thinking of new ways to act. That is why it is so important to break bad habits and replace them with positive habits. You can accomplish this by practicing the law of concentration in conjunction with the law of habit and continually thinking about how you would be with a new habit or behavior. This sends this message to your subconscious mind and eventually you begin to behave in a manner consistent with the new habits you desire. And so, my friends, let us carry forth the flame of inspiration ignited within us. As we part ways, let us not forget the profound truth that it is our daily habits, our rituals of excellence that shape the trajectory of our lives. And it is through the strokes of habit, of unwavering commitment, relentless pursuit of growth, and unyielding determination that we craft our masterpiece. So let us pledge, here and now, to embrace this habit of empowerment, to nurture it, to cultivate it, until it blooms into fruition. As you depart from this gathering, remember that the journey to greatness begins with a single step, a step towards the cultivation of habits that propel you towards your highest potential. And though the road may be fraught with challenges and obstacles, know that with each stride, you grow stronger, more resilient, more powerful than you ever thought possible. So go forth, embrace the power of habit, and let it guide you to heights beyond your wildest dreams. For in the end, it is not the destination that defines us, but the journey, the journey of self-discovery, of growth, and of transformation. And just this habit, practiced with unwavering commitment and dedication, has the power to make you powerful beyond belief. Until we meet again, may your path be illuminated by the light of possibility, and may you walk it with unwavering resolve. For within you lies the power to shape your destiny, to become the most powerful version of yourself imaginable.